So we'll look at uh, symmetry, how we can use symmetry to uh, integrate over a smaller interval. So You're still in 5.6? Yeah. So if f is even, that means f of negative x equals f of regular x. And that means y axis symmetry. So that means whatever happens on one side of the y axis happens on the other. So you could flip it around. So if I want to know how much uh, is under the graph of f from negative a to positive a, so symmetry, if we know our function is even, whatever happens between 0 and a, the similar thing or the mirror image happens from negative a to 0 on the other side. So if I knew how much area was right here, if my function was symmetric, I would have if I could draw it, that same exact amount of area over there. So I could just go and basically figure out half of it from 0 to a and then multiply by 2. So we have 2 integral 0 to a fx dx. So this is for any even function. You can do this trick. And if f is odd, which means take negative x and f it. And if you get your function back, but with a negative in front, so it's not your original function, but it's negative of your original, the symmetry you get is origin. Symmetry. And what that looks like, think about the origin. And you're going to rotate halfway around the origin. So I think about it as a propeller. You rotate halfway around, it's going to look the exact same. That's supposed to be rotational arrows. So you rotate halfway around, you get the same thing. And if we go from 0 to a, and our graph looks something like this, if you know your function's odd, what that means is from negative a to 0, your function is the rotated or reflected through the origin version. So it's going to look like this. So it's going to be the same shape, but rotated halfway around. And if it was above the x-axis, when it's rotated, it's going to be below. If it started out below, it'll rotate to be above. Are there functions that don't? Oh, yeah, most functions are not even or odd. Yeah, this is basically, if you're lucky, you get an even or odd function, you can do a shortcut. Most functions aren't going to have this property. So we're going to figure out the area from negative a to a. So what would I get if I added up both of these areas? Zero. So all that negative area would be the same amount as the positive area. So they would add up to zero. <laughs> so you get the cancellation happening. Now it's important it went from a number to negative that number. If it goes from like negative 2 to positive 4, you can't do this trick. Only if it goes negative 2 to positive 2. Well, couldn't, you do, couldn't you like take out negative 2 to 2 and negative 2 to 4? Yep. Actually, that's exactly right. Yeah, if you, if you did go negative 2 to 4, you could go negative 2 to positive 2. So you could, if your function was symmetric, you could exploit symmetry here and then separately integrate that. Although it, Probably at that point, it might just be faster to integrate from negative 2 to 4. Um, so there are some ways you can cut it up. But overall, I'd probably only use uh, symmetry if it went from negative number to a positive number. Otherwise, you're probably not going to save. You're, the chance you introduce an error is probably higher than the amount of time that you might save. All right, so we can use symmetry sometimes. and. 
do one more. We'll do one more example before we do area between two functions. So we're going to do integral x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus 6x dx. So what function are we integrating? We're integrating this fourth degree polynomial, x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus 6x. So it's is this an even function? One way to find out, well, one way to find out for sure, we test it, plug in negative x. So negative x to the fourth is regular x to the fourth. Negative x squared is regular x squared. What about 6x when I plug in a negative x? That will flip to be negative 6x when I plug in negative x. So because of that last term, it's not even right there. So that's why I made that negative sign extra bold. However, we can still exploit these properties if we're careful. So I'm going to do a uh, calculus identity. I'm going to break the integral up over a sum. And I'm going to do it for that piece and then that piece right there. So I'm going to break out the even part and the odd part. So what I did is I basically took all the odd stuff and the even stuff and I separated it out. If I wasn't going negative one, if I wasn't going negative a to positive a, this wouldn't be terribly useful. I probably should just integrate it. If I was going like negative one to three, it would have been better to just integrate and not try to use any of these properties. But I saw we're going negative 1 to positive 1, and I see there's part of this function is even, part of it's odd. So I'm separating it out with the sum property of integrals. And now I got even right here and odd right here. So what is the odd one going to add up to? Zero. So the odd one's going to cancel out, that area is going to cancel out. So this one right here is going to cancel to 0 because we're going negative 1 to 1 for an odd function. So that same amount of area is going to cancel out. Even, we can use the, we still have to do some work, but we're going to use the even property where we go from 0 to 1 and double it. So we're going to write it as 2 integral 0 to 1 x to the fourth minus 4x squared dx, and I'll just write the plus zero from the odd integral that canceled out up above. So I want you right now to integrate this function. So just power rule, add one to the power, divide by new power, and the endpoint super easy to plug in now. Plug in a one, plug in a zero, very easy to do. Just don't mess up on your antiderivative. That's the only slightly tricky part here.
questions on the antiderivative or the plugging in the values? Because there's a plus zero, do we have the plus C in addition to that? Ah, so you need a plus C on an indefinite integral. Uh, so an indefinite, so every integral we're doing in this section is definite. They have endpoints. So you're, you only need plus C on indefinite. In So indefinite integrals, those are ones without endpoints. So the reason you need the plus C is uh, when you talk about there's no the antiderivative, there are infinite antiderivatives, they're all different by a constant. Because you take derivative of anything with a plus a constant, that constant's going to disappear. Uh, so. So if f prime, big F prime equals little f, then f of x plus c prime is still going to equal to uh, little f, because that plus c doesn't matter. And so you can add whatever constant to your antiderivative and still have an antiderivative. Uh, so if you don't have endpoints, you need to have a plus a constant. And why you don't need that if you have endpoints, When we compute, so we computed antiderivatives up here somewhere. This step right here, here's where our first antiderivative appears when we actually did uh, calculus for the first time. I could have written this as 2 times 1 fifth x to the fifth minus 4 thirds x cubed. And I'm going to do something a little bit silly and write plus c, plus a constant. And now I'm going to keep going, and I'll, I'll do all this in the green marker. I'm going to keep going by plugging in endpoints right here. So I'm going to leave in the constant, basically. So we have 2 times 1 fifth minus 4 thirds plus c minus 2 times 0 minus 0 plus c. So we get the same, we got negative 17 thirds, something like that, plus c minus 2c, we have 34 thirds plus 2c minus 2c. So your C's, your constants are going to cancel out at the end. And that's going to be true uh, no matter what your function was originally. They're still there. They're, they're there, but what's the easiest? We get to actually pick what number we want to choose for C. So what's the best, the easiest number to choose for C? Yep. So we intentionally go, ah, we'll just use 0. And then we don't have to, we don't have to worry about any of those C's at all. So it, they're there, but they will all cancel out, basically. Uh, because you're supposed to find uh, the most generic antiderivative, not, one spe not a specific antiderivative. There are some times where I give you initial conditions, and we'll get into some problems uh, uh, where no, we did it last quarter, too, with, uh, in Calc 1 with the trajectory. I think we shot a golf ball out of a cannon or something like that, and we started out. No, we didn't do that? No. Okay, well, we'll do something like that very soon. Um. So the plus C, what that does is a, ver a vertical sh uh, shift. So if you knew one point on the original graph, you just take your antiderivative and shift it up or down until it actually passes through the one point that you wanted to hit. So that's basically how initial condition can work. So then you would know every other point on that graph. Yeah, so if you know what point that function should go through, that will fix the vertical sh shift of it right there.
and then that will determine the entire graph right there. One more question before we move on. Yeah. The odd graphically, mm -hmm. you can see that it does cancel out. But can you show us algebraically how the six x cancels out? Sure. Zero. Well, hopefully we'll find out if I can show it or not. Let's see. So suppose suppose f is odd which means f negative x equals f of x and f prime is equal to f so we know the antiderivative of this function let's see I think we may have to go. So the question is, what property does f prime have if your original function is odd? I want to say f prime has to be odd, or, or big F has to be odd. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. So it seems like the antiderivative would be odd as well. <coughs> so if f is odd does this make uh, f prime odd. So we'll take a derivative. So from here, we'll use the odd property of little f. So we'll use the odd property of little f. So f of negative x plus h is f of negative x minus h, which is negative f of x minus h. Minus, or this would be plus, f of regular x. So I use the odd property right there. Now I don't know what this function looks like, I just know that it's odd. So I can't, all I can really do is write out the definition of derivative. I don't know anything about the specific derivative of f. And now I'm going to factor out a negative 1 from the numerator. Which is negative lim h approaches 0. All right, why is this not quite negative? f prime of regular x. x minus h. Yeah, that stupid x minus h right there. So there is, it turns out it doesn't matter that it's x minus h. And the reason 
we'll let uh, let's let g equals negative h. So I'm just going to change the letter from h to g, basically, and call g. Uh, g is going to be the negative of what h is. So that means I don't want that extra negative sign there, though. Well, let's keep going. So. Does it say what side h approaches 0 from on our original limit? No. We've got to go both sides. So we're not assuming anything about h being positive or negative. So what number does g have to approach? So I think a number line, uh, g also will have to approach 0 right there. So h, let's say h, if h was positive, g would be just approaching 0 from the other side and vice versa. I'm worried because our negative signs cancel out now. And this would be F prime of X. I wanted f prime of negative x to be negative f prime of x, not positive f prime of x. Hmm. Ooh, I see what we did wrong. So this function right here, you could think of there's a function composition going on in the inside, which is negative 1 times x right there. It's not a good function letter that's not g and h. We'll go k. No, k seems like a constant. T. Let's, let's do alpha. Alpha of x, where alpha x equals negative x. So I'm just using this alpha of x function to make x negative. What is f prime of alpha x plus h? All we have to do right here is x plus h. What does alpha do? It makes it negative. Which is f of negative x minus h right there. So I think the mistake was our first uh, step should have been f of negative x minus h instead of negative x uh, plus h. So we'll just carefully go through and flip the sign. It's minus h. So that'll be a plus, plus, plus. This one's a, and now we don't have to do all this extra work down here. I think we're pretty much done on that step.
Uh, hold on. So we just showed that an odd function has an odd derivative. So odd functions have odd derivatives. Seems like it'd be more difficult to prove odd functions have odd antiderivatives. Uh, but I'm not. I forgot why we were doing this in the first place. Nice to know odd functions have odd derivatives, though. Ah, so if the, right, so let's assume the antiderivative of an odd function is odd. So we showed the derivative is, it's going to be a little harder to show the antiderivative, but uh, if odd functions have odd antiderivatives, fx is odd, we'll look at the integral from negative a to a. And assuming we know the antiderivative, f of x, it's going to look like that. And if big F is odd, <coughs> this is not going to be good. FA plus FA. That's not what we wanted at all. That's two F of A. I don't think this is a true statement at all. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, even polynomial derivative is an odd polynomial, and odd polynomial derivative is even polynomial. So that contradicts all this we just showed right here. So maybe what I originally wrote was right, and the odd function has an even derivative. Probably what should have been there. All right, we're sidetracked too much. Yep. Uh, all the way back up. Um, when we broke it up, our second chunk is the antiderivative from n one to one of six x dx. If you take the antiderivative of that, you get it's an even, yeah. It's an even. Yeah, I think odd antiderivatives are even, and evens are odds. So does that mean it wouldn't cancel out the zero? So, so let's correct our supposition. So this should be even. F is even. Big F is even. So what is big F of negative A? That's big F of regular A. So now that cancels out to zero right there. All right. Uh, I, well, I supposed this. I didn't prove this. I just sit down and do a little more work to, to prove that properly. I was probably on the way to proving it, 
but I'm a little tired this morning, so. Uh, Oh. oh, you just assume uh, what I put right here. Yeah, so you can assume, yeah, you don't have to prove anything that I use in class. I try to prove as much as I can to you okay. so that you see that's all connected and comes from somewhere aside from just because the book says so or because I say so. And proof uh, helps out algebra skills as well. So let's cross out all this stuff. <laughs> I have a feeling it sh probably should have been a plus like it was originally right there. That's probably where we went wrong. So let's get rid of all this stuff. Sorry, class, for breaking the teacher temporarily. It's all right, we're back. All right. And then something similar would happen if you had an even function, your antiderivative would be odd, and it would look like it was looking here where f of a would be f a plus f a, so 2 f of a. All right, area between two functions. So our two functions will go y equals f of x and y equals g of x. So we also have to choose some interval for x. x will go between a and b. And we're not assuming any properties of even and odd overall. We'll just occasionally, if we notice a function is even, we'll just shortcut it a little bit and use that property that we just saw. So here's the area for uh, the area between two functions, f and g. All right, this has an absolute value in it. How did I tell you to deal with absolute values in calculus? Split it up. Split it up into, so what type of function are we going to create? Step function. So we're going to make a step function or a piecewise function, however you like to call them. So always with absolute value, and this is true, when I say always, I mean always in calculus class, this is true for derivatives and antiderivatives. We saw it with absolute value of x function where it had one slope on one side, a positive one slope, and then a negative one slope on the other side. And the place where the two slopes don't agree is right where you switch <laughs> from positive, the original function from positive to negative. So if we have a regular, just a standard absolute value of x, the step function is, it's regular f of x or negative f of x, and it's regular f when f of x is already greater than or equal to zero, and it's negative x if f of x is not greater than or equal to zero. So you just split it up into one is a positive, one is a negative. So taking that same idea, this step function is going to look like f minus g when fx minus gx greater than zero. Greater than or equal to zero and negative fx minus gx when fx minus gx less than zero. So I just basically wrote the exact same thing a second time with just f minus g instead of just f. I could rewrite it slightly different way. Instead of negative, uh, the negative part, I could write it as distribute your negative sign. You have negative fx plus g of x, or you could write it as g of x minus f of x. Just reverse the order right there. And 
And the inequality, I'm going to add g of x to the right side. And same thing for the second inequality. And adding or subtracting, you never have to worry about your inequality flipping around. So you could treat subtraction absolute value either of these two ways. They're equivalent. I like to think of the second way for area between two functions because just looking at the conditions right here, you can decide when is f above g and when is f below g. So when they, one function stops being the top one and starts to be the bottom function, and they may switch back and forth a couple times. Out of curiosity, because uh, absolute value function is undefined at a point, and it's not undefined at a point um, necessarily. Necessarily. Okay. Reflect, reflect, right? It'll, yeah. Basically, you take. If you, if you remove the absolute value and you graph that function, you would take whatever was negative and reflect it to be positive. Okay. But it would just be on those x values where it was negative, you would reflect that part of the graph, not the, not the entire graph. So we're going to do examples now to compute or to, to use this area formula. So we're going to find the area of the region bounded by. So we're going to write region bounded by probably 100 to 200 times this quarter. So we're going to use RBB to substitute for region bounded by. So we're going to see that abbreviation quite a bit. Region bounded by y equals 2 minus x squared, and y equals negative x. So we have not done a region bounded by problem yet. So what we're going to do is very carefully graph this out and figure out exactly what this region looks like. So whenever I give you a region, uh, all of our regions are going to be finite, meaning your x value should never go from negative infinity to something, or from something to positive infinity. So if you're, if you're graphing it out, and it looks like you have some infinite region, you, something went wrong in the graph, or I asked you a bad question. So go ahead and graph these two equations. They should be pretty easy to graph. You can flip this first quadratic around, negative x squared plus 2. So it's a sad parabola shifted up 2. And then the second function is just a line, slope negative 1, intercept 0. You can graph that very easily. So graph them out and figure out what region are we talking about. Hopefully there's one obvious region that's bounded. So if you have an accurate graph, you should be able to tell what the m m maximum and minimum x values are. Oh, details. Oh, no. 
I went too far and there's no redo button. Yeah. All right. Let's. So it should be obvious what the region is. There's only one of one on this air, this uh, area that is finite. And we'll shade in. So it's this part right there. So when I say infinite, if you did the area of this region down here, that would be infinite. And any of the other partitions of the plane would be infinite. So those are not the ones we're talking about. So now we have our region. Let's actually figure out the points of intersection without using the graph. It's not always easy to find a graph. So we have a system of two equations, y equals 2 minus x squared, and the other one y equals negative x. So this is a system, two equations, and there's two unknowns. They're not linear. Well, one of them's not linear, so you can't use your matrices or Cramer's rule or any of that fun stuff from pre-cal 1. All right, so test out your algebra skills. Don't just look at your graph and write down the x, y values. You can check off of that, but don't just um, look at that. Substitution or elimination are ways to go here. So you know y equals negative x, so you can take out y and sub negative x in there. So when in doubt, substitution is a good fallback. If you use elimination, you can subtract equations and get your y out of there that way. algebra questions on intersecting points of intersection here. So all we did was solve two equations. So hopefully when I scroll out and look at the graph, we get those points, negative 1, 1, and positive 2, negative 2. All right, so those are the correct points. So if I'm making an x interval, My small x value is negative 1, and my large x value is positive 2. So I use negative 1 and positive 2 right there. So I just picked out the two x values to go between. Now, what function is on the top? What function is on the bottom? I have to decide what's the big one, what's the little one. So the area I'm using is the second one, the second version, where you decide uh, if f is bigger than g, it's going to be f minus g. If g is the bigger function, it's going to be g minus f. The best way to think about this is big minus small. Oh, no. 
we'll make it. All right, so we got big minus small. That's going to come up again and again and again. So I'll put it inside of the box so you remember it. Big minus small. So which one's big? Is it the quadratic or the linear? Quadratic. So quadratic's the big, linear's the small. You can see right off the graph. Uh, if your graph is more complicated, unfortunately, all the work we just did didn't tell us which one is above and below. It told us where they're equal. Didn't give us any information about which one is above or below. So if I want to know above and below, all I have to do is we got negative 1, positive 2. I just pick an x value between negative 1 and positive 2. And f it and g it and see which has the bigger value, f or g. So what's the good number between negative 1 and 2? Zero. Ah, oh, 0. Very good. So we're going to take 0 and f it and take 0 and g it. So I think g of 0 is 0, f of 0 is 2. Yep. Hey, so f wins. So f's the top function. f of x greater than or equal to g of x on the interval negative 1 to 2. Different story once you leave the interval. They're going to switch places. But for the interval we care about, negative 1 to 2, f's on the top, g's on the bottom. So it's going to be f minus g. We're finally ready to line that up. Area equals integral a to b, fx minus gx dx which was negative 1 to 2. We don't have to worry about them crossing. There's only one interval we're using, and f is bigger than g, so I no longer need the absolute values because I'm already guaranteed that f is bigger than g. I worked that out. Plug in f and g. f was 2 minus x squared. minus g, which was negative x dx. So this antiderivative is easy enough that you can do it. Just anti-power rule, plug in the endpoints. It's not negative, it's, uh, even odds not going to help you much here. You'll spend more time splitting it up and changing your intervals around than you will uh, saving time. So I wouldn't try to go for even odd properties here. So just go anti-power rule, 